Hello. 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 That's not to say that it isn't hard work. What it isn't so hard to do, you just gotta do the hard work. It's the hard thing. All right, here, here to follow up on what I was saying before, are two Nobel laureates that I knew before they got the Nobel Prize, because they were at Berkeley, Carolyn Potosi. She was head of the uh, molecular foundry. Their job was to make interesting molecules and stuff. And then she got a higher way to Stanford when it was clear she was doing great stuff. Because Stanford likes to bring people in so they can get the Nobel Prize. And uh, she, she got this from click chemistry. Right? And it's, uh, it's interesting because it's both biology and chemistry. And on the right hand side are Jennifer Dudna, who is a professor at Berkeley. And, uh, and Emmanuel Charpente. Emmanuel Charpene didn't have a job when she got her Nobel Prize. Well, she's a little obnoxious to get along with, so it's partly understandable, but it's, it's a funny kind of thing. She's French, so you have, to, you have to understand it. But they got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of CRISPR-Cas9, which is the thing that, that bacteria and, and uh, uh, do to protect themselves against viruses. They click snip out a part of uh, DNA and replace it with another gene uh, sequence. And that has made it possible for us to think of doing these um, gene treatments, gene therapy, where we go and treat people, and if you have arthritis, we take the arthritis gene out and put in the gene that corrects and makes your bones right. Or if you have diabetes, you correct the diabetes gene and, and fix it so that it's Those things are now technically possible with some result. So what do they do, right? Well look, it's chemistry, it's biology, but it's both biology, because biology is the future. Next slide. Okay, so here's the CRISPR-Cas9. It takes the, the DNA, it cuts out some stuff and replaces it with the right kind of section of the gene. Well, that's pretty cool. Let's just take the scissors, cut out the bad genes, stick it a good gene, right? And now you gotta put it back in person and do it. And you can do it by either replacing the genes in the person, or you can have a virus or bacteria whose job is to go in and replace the genes, because that's what bacteria is. They, they take the cell's machinery and, and, and do it. And so it's, uh, so the, the bottom right one shows you what the cell configuration looks like, where it's going in there and snapping snap into people's lives and doing it. So there are 10 simple rules of the Nobel Prize. So it turns out Nobel laureates we ask this question pretty often. That's why, you know, Michael, you know, I was talking, I've been to several, like three or four different things with Michael Levin, and he always gives a part of his talk what a great place he went to because the leader brought in these people and they ended up at this little institution having something like 14 Nobel laureates, right? Crick and Watson were there, for example. And they got the Nobel Prize. It's a, it's a boy. So, first of all, don't start your career looking for the Nobel Prize. Try and do the best science you can. That's it. So, there were several people that were contributed to this from to the questions that were asked. And it was written up by Philip Warren, the national. Yeah. You know, Hope your experiments fail occasionally. Now, I used to have this this attitude, which is, if you do enough adventuresome experiments, some of them are going to fail because it's too hard or it's too whatever it is. And that means you're taking enough risk if occasionally you fail. Getting funding got so hard, you were not really allowed to fail anymore. But what he means is when your experiment should come out a certain way because of the theory, and it fails, it means you should study it and understand why it failed, because it's probably going to tell you, you know, some really new important science. That's how some of the great discoveries were made. Okay, and the other thing, this is the bad part. Collaborate with other scientists, but never more than two other people. That's because the Nobel Prize rules are, except for the Peace Prize, all the science prizes, 
it can go to no more than three people. <laughs> if you happen to be the four, I was on a committee and we had four people that, that, that I and other members, you know, I was chair of the committee, were convinced were worthy of getting a prize for this thing. And you can't give it to four, you can only give the three, right? And it was a big problem. It was trying to figure out which of the three out of the four we should give it to. It's, you know, it's a difficult thing. Especially when some people had figured out that this thing was going in, but we're lobbying and so forth. Okay. If you want to increase your odds of winning, pick your family. There are families that actually are sequential in Nobel Prizes. And one of the people got it the year I got it. His father got it. His father was in the, up on the stage in the United States too, celebrating that his son was getting it. Okay. So another good thing is work in the laboratory of a previous Nobel Prize winner. It turns out a lot of people get the Nobel Prize, work for Nobel Laureate, and they learn good habits, and they learn good behaviors, and that's, that's the work they do. And they learn how to have the good ideas and, and to do things. Okay? So better than rule five is to work in the laboratory of a future Nobel Prize winner. Because if there's only three of you, you'll probably get it too. <laughs> See, I told you this was easy. <laughs> right. And always in design, and this your best experience at a time when your lyric is running high. Sometimes you're in the groove and you can do no wrong. That's the time to do a great experiment. It's like occasionally the lottery gets high and Nora's being lucky and substituting and I tell her, buy a lottery ticket for us. <laughs> right? If you're, you know, well, that's a little more, a little more science. Right? So never play in your life while you know a prize. That's the same as number one. And you should always be nice to Swedish scientists because there's a whole complicated sequence of people getting nominated and reviewed and, and so forth. But in the end, they, they, there are at least three sets of people, always two, two sets of uh, people, but usually three, who got, and then the Swedish Academy votes for who actually gets the offer, right? Especially if somebody has, it, it has happened that the Lovers have died just before the announcement, and then it's you know, unfortunate. And, uh, okay. And then the tenth one, which is easy, because I'm recommending this as yours. Study biology. Chemistry is a field in which about half of the Nobel Prizes are actually biology prizes. So you got 1.5 times the chance of getting the Nobel Prize if you're a biologist than if you're a physicist or a chemist. So, but you shouldn't be just doing this to do this, right? Here's another picture, a very recent one. And uh, the, uh, you notice there were, there were a lot of women earlier. Uh, women in biology have, have, have scored big in more recent years. Um, and, uh, you know, these guys, they got to know a prize for making a new tool. That is, they made a device they could make a light, set, a light pulse that's 10 to the minus 12 seconds long, an adipulse. So, you can see the electrons undergoing chemical reactions in living things by doing that, if you don't try living things. You can actually see the quantum changes and the, and the chemical reactions going on in life. So this is going to be a big tool. So the Nobel laureate, you know, found the Nobel laureate choosers, they saw this is a great tool, we'll do that. Just like magnetic resonance imaging has got three different sets of Nobel Prizes for advances in technology and so on. If it's something that's going to allow advances in sciences or allow something good for, for humans, then they'll yeah, do that. Uh, this other picture is a picture of Peter Higgs, who got the, the 2013 prize for the Higgs boson, and he was uh, lobbying for one of his friends when we were trying to decide which three out of four we're going to get. I have some that are in, that are rules, that were rules partly expanded by me and partly expanded by uh, Charles Munger. I don't know if you guys know who Munger is. He was, you know, in, he was the vice president of Berkshire Hathaway and he actually realized you have to learn to think. That is, 
that humans have a lot of failures. But he said the first rule of fishing is to fish where the fish are. This is true in life. You don't go looking, you know, for polar bears in the Sinaloa. <laughs> it's not a good place to find polar You. This is true for many things in life. It's a rule, not just getting a boat, prizes, but it's a rule for success in life. So you have to recognize where the opportunities are. You have to do the hard work of checking to see what's been done before and what worked and what didn't, right? And also then look and see what is it everybody knows is true but isn't true, right? What do they assume is right but isn't really right? And there's lots of examples of that and I think there are still some around. I see some stuff that I think is sufficient. And the other thing, and I learned this from one of my mentors, is uh, what opportunities do exist for new knowledge, new things that we understand, or new technologies. If somebody just invented a nanosecond pulse, what experiment can I do first that can let me understand some incredible chemical reaction in human beings or mice or plants that, that allow, that I will understand what makes life the way it does. Right? So as that new technology, can I be the first one to apply it in a whole new way and make a great discovery? Right? So you gotta prepare, you gotta be patient, you gotta be disciplined, and you gotta be objective. You can't love the answer too much. That's what human value. humans have. So humans are bad scientists. They're worse at living, but they're really bad as scientists. They gotta guard against the you know the failures that humans have. And then the other thing that Munger liked to say, but I also understood that from the mathematician part of stuff, Jakob Yopiki, he said, you've always got to invert the problem. That is, don't try and solve the problem forward, do it backwards and see what the assumptions of the flaws are, so that you can look to see when going forward you're getting right. Those are, those are things that allow people to do it. It's just like one of my colleagues said, he got the Nobel Prize in chemistry, because he worked on chemicals that were dangerous, smelled bad, or you know, had some other big problem with it. Nobody else wanted to work on it. So he was the only one working on those things, and you know, you went through enough, you find something. That's, here are my shorthands again before I get into the, the 24, 25 errors that everybody makes. You gotta be lucky. No, I mean, it's, that's why you buy the lottery ticket when you're on the roll. It's, it's why you do your best experiment, but it's why you gotta be lucky. If nature isn't doing what you're looking for, you're not gonna find it, right? I mean, nature is the one that decides. Yeah, and you work really, really hard. I mean, that's the problem. It's easy to tell you how to get to a price. It's not so easy to do all the hard work, right? So you also pick an area that's useful, right, and not so worked over. There's plenty of areas where people have been working on it very hard for very many years. Much harder to make a big step forward in that kind of a situation. The steps forward, things usually get to a plateau, and there has to be some really novel or new idea that brings you to the next step up. And it's exciting when you're going to that next step. But on that plateau, it's a little boring because you don't make so much fun. All right? And here is, again, do the reverse problem. Right? Invert, always invert. Reverse the problem can aid and figure out what the solution is. If you see what the answer is and you move forward or back, then you can maybe see what the connections are and what you have to do. Right? And this is the hardest one to teach students. Be confident that you can do and address the scientific questions you're talking about. Then you check and you double check and you try and get rid of your biases because every human being has biases. And so here's an example. On the left is the measurements of the speed of light from 1878 to 1983. Do you see anything about this? Does the speed of light look like it was constant with time, or does it look like it changed? How can it be that it looks like that, that the measured value of the speed of light looks like that? Well, the answer is, you're very prejudiced. You like to see that somebody else got the same answer you did, once you see your answer and their answer is the same, you don't look hard for any more corrections or, or things you need to do to check your answer. You get, you get lazy, you get sloppy. 
And so what you see here is classically this thing, this is what my miniature is teaching. You see the speed of light changing with time by an amount that's larger than the error bar, so special orders of time. And then you see the answers, they jump many standard deviations, so that's many estimates of the error, and then one longer, we're going to get the same answer. Does that mean the speed of light changed with time? Or does that mean the answer to the speed of light never changed with time? And the answer is it means the answer changed because people were biased and make mistakes. So there's all this discussion about the, the Hubble Space Ring. So in a minute, if we, if we make it, I have a picture of my co-author. My co-author is my, my Mexican, uh, Jorge Cervantes Bata, and Salvador. Uh, we just published a paper on the history of the Hubble concept and what the Hubble tension is. And it's clear that people underestimated the error in the Hubble concept for a long time. I actually had an argument with Standage some years ago in a meeting when I said, he said the answer is 42, and I said, what are the errors? He said, we don't got no errors. <laughs> we don't got no same errors, right? It's the, uh, you know, I could not believe it because uh, it's a uh, There are 24 standard causes that I had, but I didn't quite finish this part of the talk because I was hoping that they would say stop by now. And, you know, people are not linear thinkers. They don't solve all the big equations. They guess and jump to answers. When you're driving down the street, do you do the calculations of the trajectory, or do you just point and steer? And the answer is you just point and steer. Most people are pointing and steering for their whole life. The only the most important problem is you actually try and figure out a little better. But most people don't even do that. So what psychologists do is they look and see how people make decisions, and they do it by reinforcement. And one of those reinforcements is incentives. And there are many cases where companies set up incentives, and the result they get is exactly equal to the incentives because people optimize to get this way out. So, for example, China gave everybody a month's salary every time they got a paper published or mentioned in a big journal because they wanted to get worldwide presence. And guess what? They got a lot of papers in, in, in college. If you give people an extra month's salary, you know, they have incentive to do it. And so they do. And not all the papers were really are good or even right, but they got paid for it. So the biggest one that humans have is denial. If the answer doesn't agree with what they think it should be, they deny it. They say, is something wrong here? I better do the experiment again, or something like that. Or they just say, it's not right. And go on. And you see that in everyday life, every day, not just once. You see it every single day. And so humans have all of these things. And there is a consistency and commitment tendency. Once you get to where you like some answer, you don't want to change that answer, even if the real world shows you it's not like that. If you deny that the real world will be right, you get it wrong. And it goes on and on. So let me do the next slide, just to show you what I have most of So there's one, number five is missing. I didn't, I didn't get these slides finished. Oh, yeah. uh, he's a professor at UNAM, mm -hmm. and he's actually, he was supposed to come here because he wanted to be involved, but the big collaboration I got him involved in is having the collaboration meeting in Hawaii right now. So I was sending him messages back and forth because we were our paper was selected to be the cover paper and they want a little abstract and a cover picture. But he's in Hawaii instead of Sinaloa. And so, sorry, Omar. <laughs> you could have been in Hawaii. <laughs> but I think he would be glad to be in Sinaloa. Thank you.